Religious organizations should be able to exercise their right to religious freedom. Religious freedom involves more than simply the freedom to worship. The American Religious Town Hall meeting is now in session. Welcome, friends, to the American Religious Town Hall meeting, where the discussion of religious, political, and social issues is meant to promote the cause of religious freedom and to help us better understand each other. And now, here's your host and moderator, Pastor Jerry Lutz. Thank you, Mark. And I, too, would like to welcome you to this edition of the American Religious Town Hall Meeting. We're so very glad you've joined us for today's program. As you heard from the opening statements, this is going to be an interesting one. Glad you're here. Let's meet our panelists today. We'll begin with a gentleman to my right, and we'll hear from each one. Tell us who you are and a little bit about what you do. Hello, my name is Mel Robeck. I'm Senior Professor of Church History and Ecumenics and Special Assistant to the President for Ecumenical Relations at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. I'm also an ordained minister with the Assemblies of God. Hi, I'm Tony Matthews, and I serve as Senior Pastor for North Garland Baptist Fellowship in Garland, Texas. I'm Andrea Luxton. I'm president of Andrews University, which is in Bering Springs, Michigan, which is affiliated with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm Bishop Michael Olson, and I'm the bishop of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Fort Worth, Texas. Hi, I'm Carl Trovall. I'm the Richard J. Dinda, professor of Lutheran Identity and Mission at Concordia University in Austin, Texas. And I'm Tom Plumley. I'm the senior minister at First Christian Church in downtown Fort Worth, Texas. We're a part of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Well, thank you everyone for being here today. I'm looking forward to this discussion. Glad you could take time out of your busy schedule to be here with us for this discussion today. Let's get right to it. In February of 2019, a lawsuit was filed by a Roman Catholic family in South Carolina claiming they were discriminated against because of their faith. The family had applied to provide foster care through that state's largest foster care child placement agency called Miracle Hill Ministries. They had been found to qualify as a foster family in every way except that they were Roman Catholics, and Miracle Hill only places children with evangelical Protestants. Both the state through its Department of Social Services and its governor, and the federal government through the Department of Health and Human Services had found Miracle Hill well within its First Amendment rights to free exercise of their religion in denying services to the Catholic family. The suit alleges that both levels of government have issued sweeping religious exemptions from federal and state religious anti-discrimination requirements to allow any faith-based foster care child placement agency in the state to refuse to recruit, work with, train, or place children with prospective foster parents who do not share the private child placement agency's religious beliefs. The suit calls such action irrational and illegitimate and, quote, ostensibly protecting religious freedom by expressly authorizing and funding religious discrimination, close quote. Defendants and their supporters, including a rabbinical group called the Coalition of Jewish Values, argue that the freedom to work strictly with co-religionists is a key American freedom that should be protected. Today I'm going to ask the panelists to answer at least these three questions. First of all, in what sorts of matters should religious freedom allow religious groups to discriminate against other religious groups? Second question, does the reasoning of the U.S. Supreme Court in allowing individuals in business to discriminate against LGBT people apply here? And then finally, how might the outcome of this case affect decisions about foster parenting in the future? That's our subject for today. Let's go to our panelists now and hear from them to see what their takes are on this subject. We'll first go back to those who made the opening remarks. And Tony Matthews, we're glad to have you here today. Good being Can here. Can you elaborate on your opening statement for us, please? Uh, yes. Um, I think this is a uh, fascinating um, report here. When I read about the Miracle Hill Ministries and the work that they do in South Carolina, it was, it was absolutely just amazing 
amazing to see the type of work that they do. Um, the ministry has um, four homeless ministries. They have four children ministries. They um, do services in the community that deal with um, recovery for addicts. Um, and they have a plethora of material that covers the same. And um, with the um, um, crisis that South Carolina um, foster care um, system has, I thought it was just a little uh, an overreach to even bring a suit against a, a ministry that's doing mm -hmm. such great work. And um, I'm glad that um, the Department of um, um, Human and Health Services, uh, along with the federal government and the governor, um, kind of gave them a break. And I think we should um, at all times allow ministries that are doing great work for the community to continue without impeding them. I thought the suit was also, the argument was just absent, absent of um, pragmatism. It's, it's, just, it's not practical to, to um, um, uh, expect a ministry or an organization to stop doing all of the good works for one or two people. All right, thank you very much. Bishop Olson, glad to have you on the program. You also made an opening statement. Tell us more, please. Yes. Well, I, um, I'm, I'm in basic agreement, I think, in the principle of religious liberty in this case, where um, it's clear that this uh, organization is very clear on their policies and it's a part of the practice of their religion. Um, you know, while I see it as unfortunate, and, uh, you know, and I wouldn't share their theology on it, um, I think that they, they have a right or responsibility to do it as, as they're doing it. Um, and if the state has a problem with it, then the state can either run the services themselves or possibly seek other organizations to do this uh, in their contracts. I think um, that also, uh, you know, religious liberty is a, well, I would disagree with with the content uh, of their theology and their practice, I, I really think it's important to uphold their right to do it. Uh, that's authentic to their faith tradition. There are also other organizations that, that this family could access uh, for foster care. My one caveat would be if the child was uh, closer towards, uh, you know, uh, the age of reason or having passed an age of reason and discernment. And if they were already practicing the Catholic religion, then I could see this as a possible infringement on their religious liberty. Uh, but otherwise, I, I, I find myself, um, you know, in agreement with the uh, uh, the practice of the or the organization. All right, thank you very much. Good points, both of you. Let's go down the table to Reverend Plumley. Glad to have you here today too. Thank Reverend you. Plumley, your take on the subject. Well, uh, uh, I'm I'm going to take on both of you because because I don't think this was rightly decided at all. And the key issue is that uh, Miracle Hill receives federal tax dollars, and with that there comes an expectation that uh, certain types of discrimination are not going to be allowed. Now, religious discrimination for the purposes of religious freedom is something that we need to stand behind. Uh, and I do not disagree with that. Uh, there's, there's some, in some matters, uh, re religious discrimination uh, is a proper exercise of religious freedom. But this family, because Miracle Hill is is the state's largest uh, 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 foster care placement uh, agency. Uh, this family was, because of, of Miracle Hill's discrimination, effectively uh, denied the opportunity uh, to be uh, foster parents. Uh, the religious discrimination for purposes of religious freedom uh, was once upon a time in this country a, a very fringe issue that was not, uh, was not exercised uh, very often. Now, in the past few years, that has become a, a real mainstream uh, sort of thing. Um, and and uh, to me, that kind of discrimination with the use of tax dollars is, you know, we talk about slippery slopes. Well, this one's already on the slippery slope and, and is well down the, the, the side toward the uh, whatever's, whatever's negative on the other side of, of slippery slopes. All right. Thank you, Reverend Plumlee. Let's come over to Dr. Luxton. Your take, please. Yeah, I, I've, I've got to disagree again. Uh, to me, I, I think, you know, we have a bucket and we throw all discrimination to that bucket. It's like it's one bucket, and I'm not sure it's that simple. Um, it seems to me that any organization, any charitable organization, 
um, has the right to define its mission and then it applies for the right to operate within its mission. And if that is approved, then it has every right to do that. And it's not discriminatory to, to if, they, if they act within that mission. Um, it, if this was the only foster care opportunity in the whole of the state, that would be a different thing. Just because it's the largest doesn't mean to me that it, it has to operate differently from if it was the smallest. Um, so and I think that basic principle of uh, any organization to, um, the, to fulfill its mission within its stated purposes, um, and that faith tradition is extremely important. Um, that allows the identity of those uh, traditions to, to continue and succeed. So I, I think it had to, I think, I'm, I think this action decision was correct. All right, thank you. Dr. Robeck, we're glad to have you back today. Well, thank you. Uh, what, are, what are your comments on this subject, please? Well, I, I, uh, when I got the paragraph kind of opening this thing, I went to the website to see what does this ministry look like. And it's very clear right up front that they are a Protestant ministry. They have a statement of faith that says uh, we expect mm -hmm. the following kinds of things from the people that either work for us or participate in this foster program. So when I read that someone else comes in and says, well, I want to change those rules for me, I, I don't think that's a really a discriminatory act. I think they've made a choice, in, in essence, to violate the freedom of this church or this group uh, to carry out the ministry as it is. Like, uh, like Andrea here, uh, you know, I work in an academic realm and, and of course we have accrediting associations. And the accrediting associations always say, as long as you're dealing specifically with the ministry that you have and you're working with that, it's not a problem. You know, we can, we can accredit you. But the second you violate your own standards, then we have a problem. And I think the courts have understood this, but I also, I also know that this is a messy issue, uh, as Tom has pointed out, uh, when you get faith and government put together. Mm. My, my uh, response to Tom would be something like, well, it's possible for this particular group to be only Protestants, it's possible for another one to be only Catholic, or another one only to be Jewish, or whatever else it is. Uh, and uh, none of them will fall under uh, the uh, aegis of, of being uh, discriminatory simply because they say we're concerned about the spiritual, material, physical welfare of this child as a whole. All right, thank you. Dr. Troval, your perspective, please. I tend to uh, agree with the, the four of you. Tom, I probably dis disagree with you the most. Um, that's why I'm way down here. I, I know. Yeah, I exactly, myself. exactly. Uh, and I, I just want to add one component. I like everything that's been said, and I won't repeat any of it, but I think a couple of things. Number one, child rearing entails a significant faith component. Uh, any of us who have a commitment to our faith, our faith tradition, and raising children, one of the important things is to raise our child uh, with uh, the faith tradition that we're in uh, and to, to raise that child up in that particular way. And to deny someone, um, to, uh, because of that, I th that's why I think it's important to discriminate here because this ministry specifically wants people to be raised with this particular faith tradition. And I agree, if there were no other <laughs> options, that would be a whole different situation. Now, I will acknowledge, Tom, one part, and that is they do accept state funds. There you go. And yeah, that, that is, is really entailing. And I, only, I'm thinking as an educator, our students at Concordia, they, they take loans from the they federal, federal government, right? We get federal aid. And when a school decides to do that, they should be warned that that comes with strings. Yes. And the strings are that you cannot discriminate against in certain ways and and this is a this is a perfect example of of how that has been overblown uh, but you know, yeah, you know but even to when Dr. Lux, let's, but even, let's even when you accept a federal aid, because I think that's a great example, you're still allowed to operate within your mission. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there are certain elements that you cannot discriminate against, but you're still allowed to operate within your mission. Mm -hmm. And if that mission is accepted uh, and the money is given, then that is perfectly appropriate. If, if that mission is that we will not place any African American kids anywhere, no. or we will not place any uh, Hispanic a, kids a, with African American parents, mm -hmm. or if their mission is stated, we will not place any white kids with people that, that, that you know do not have a European heritage. 
Uh, all those okay. things go beyond the pale. <laughs> Bishop yes. Olson, then, does Bishop different. Olson, then Tony Matthews. <laughs> it's different. Hold on just a second. Bishop Olson, then Tony Matthews. Well, I, I don't see how this one goes is equivalent to racial discrimination because there's a certain component of the will here with regard to religious practice of faith and race is not a, an act of the will. But I, I would go further though, the state, the, the state contracts with this organization to help with foster care as a public good and a public service. The state objects to this particular mission to the point of it, they don't have to contract with this mission, right. right? These are not agencies of the state. And the moment they become so, we have a state religion, which is unconstitutional. All right, Dr. Matthews. Right, I, I would push back a little bit on Brother Tom as well. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and really, if, if, a, if a religious organization has a mission, as Andrea said, and is following that mission, I think we need to ask the question, is it discriminatory? It, should the word discrimination even be part of mm -hmm. this, this topic? I don't think so. And the slippery slope that Tom mentioned, this is one reason why um, organizations have mission statements, so they won't go down a slippery slope as they interpret it. Um, as the second question asks, um, um, how does this affect um, same-sex marriage couples that want to adopt? This Protestant organization doesn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the slippery slope that they're trying to avoid. So the linchpin, uh, Reverend Plumley, public funding. If, yes. there were no, if there were no public funding. They're, they're, they're using my dollars to discriminate. All right, so Dr. Troval, your response they, to that. They are, but the state has an interest in there not being a, a whole bunch of children who don't have parents. That's it's, right. It's in the state's interest to do that, but I think it's in the state's interest also to protect people's religious belief at the same time. All right, then, uh, Dr. Robeck. Yeah, if you live anywhere close to me, you know that the state's done a terrible job at the foster care level. It's just, it's horrendous. And for a Christian organization or any other religious organization to take that on and say, we can screen these people better than the state can, we ought to do this. I think that's a good thing. Remind our audience you where see, you live. You mentioned, I live in right? California. Well, okay, all right. Thank <laughs> you. <very much. laughs> and then Reverend Plumley, your response, please. Well, I live in Texas, but I once lived in California <laughs> for a short and, time. You know, the, the, it's not as if the Roman Catholic Church were some fly-by-night cult that had just sprung up around the personality <laughs> of of Christ. one guy uh, <laughs> uh, and, and practiced, practiced so child sacrifice and, and used methamphetamine as a sacrament. Right. You know, it's not that kind of organization. No. Uh, it's rather well established, actually. Uh, has been around for a while. And, and some, Bishop Olson, some would you days, like to Some days to when we're on our game, <laughs> but uh, this thing. I, it, I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I, I do agree with that part, but I, I don't, th I still think that, I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, there's a mission to the identity of this organization that wants to maintain the integrity of its faith life, all right? And so, as is with Jewish children, all right, it was a huge issue of assimilation, and that's a disagreement, that's respected as well. And I think that, um, you know, the state, you know, if the state wants to do this themselves, then we need to, we need to invest in a public way in that. Uh, but if if they want to, they can always contract with other organizations to do so. And I think that's uh, that's an important principle of of respect for religious freedom as well as maintaining the state interests uh, for the for the common good, especially those ch vulnerable children. I'm just uh, concerned that the best interest of the child is not the preeminent concern here. All right, thank you, Dr. 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 Luxton. Uh, and I would, I would question, I would suggest that maybe it is the best interest of the child um, in the sense that those who will be using this foster service, going back to the importance of, the, of growing up in a faith tradition and continuing that faith tradition and the stability that comes with that. And I think finding a, a foster connection where that faith tradition is continued may be really, really important to the child. Whatever that tradition is, whether it's, whether it's Jewish or, or, or Muslim or Roman Catholic, or it doesn't matter. I think, I think that capacity to do that is, is maybe very, very important for the child. And Dr. Matthews wanted to add something to this. Uh, yeah, just I think the most... Um, 
powerful piece for me that came out of this was the, um, the voice of the Roman Catholic um, Diocese of Charleston. Mm -hmm. And they say the Catholic Diocese of Charleston supports Miracle Hill Ministries' ability to assist in placing vulnerable children in safe and stable homes in our state. This organization should not be forced to discontinue these life-affirming services because they desire to serve children consistent with their Protestant faith. That is from the Roman Catholic Diocese of Charleston. I think that speaks volumes. All right, thank you. That happens to be the last statement for this segment too, because we're out of time. And thank you so much, but the program's not finished yet. We want you to stand by, if you would please, for an important announcement. We'll be back for the summations in just a few moments. Thank you, Pastor Lutz. We hope you are enjoying today's program. If you would like to learn more about the American Religious Town Hall, please visit our website at AmericanReligious.org. That's AmericanReligious.org. There you can read about the mission and history of the program, learn about the Town Hall Estates, and view past programs by clicking the appropriate menu buttons. Each week, Pastor Lutz looks forward to receiving your letters. You may write to him at the address shown on your screen. Send your letters to Pastor Jerry Lutz, American Religious Town Hall Meeting, P.O. Box 180118, Dallas, Texas 75218. That's Pastor Jerry Lutz, American Religious Town Hall Meeting, P.O. Box 180118, Dallas, Texas 75218. Thank you for writing and thank you for watching. And now back to you, Pastor Lutz, and today's closing statements. Welcome back. I'm glad you stood by to listen to the summations. But before we do that, I too would like to encourage you to go to the website. You can email us there. You can send us regular mail. Drop us a card. Drop us a letter. Tell us what you like about the program. Tell us what you don't like about the program. And some few, of course, there's everything to like about the program. But we're looking for your opinion, and we appreciate that. And so you can tell us about future programs you'd like for us to have or, or subjects you'd like for us to discuss here on the Town Hall. We're going to go to our panelists now and ask them to summarize their thoughts on the subject. Let's begin with the gentleman to my right, Dr. Robeck, you're yes. first. I may not agree with the statement of faith that this particular ministry has. It may be too narrow from my perspective. I do not understand why they couldn't accept Catholics, except they've said their mission is to Protestants in this particular arena. We all know that we have thousands of children that are at risk in foster care throughout the nation. One of the questions I would ask myself is, if I, as a parent, were to die and my children were to go into foster care, who would I trust to raise them? That would be my question uh, for those who, who do so. Thank you. Dr. Luxton, your summation, please. No, I, I think it's very important that we don't um, battle over rights here um, and ignore the responsibility that we have to look after the children. Um, it seems here that in this case, the state has looked at this organization and feels, you know, this is the best group uh, to manage this type of arrangement with these children. Um, and I think I would 100% support that. Uh, just helping them give the greatest ability as they can in a transfer into a foster situation. And a faith transfer is one of the most important elements, I think, of that transfer. Thank you. Dr. Trovall, your summary, please. Uh, faith, uh, mir excuse me, Miracle Hill Ministries, uh, it, it calls itself a ministry, and as such, um, I believe that it has that right to um, uh, uh, engage in its ministry in the way that it sees fit. And the state clearly sees it helping for the common good, the, the children uh, of the state. And uh, I think that the discrimination here uh, that occur has occurred is, uh, is appropriate because it preserves the freedom of Miracle Hill to do its ministry. All right, and thank you, Reverend Plumley. Your summation, please. Uh, thank you. I, I, I think it's been interesting uh, as, we've, as we've gone around to get down to what each of the panelists really thinks is the most important uh, uh, part of a uh, foster child uh, for a foster, foster placement agency. Uh, and that is uh, basically, uh, Mel said, uh, someone that the parents might trust. And Andrea said, uh, get the, the greatest stability for the child. That's talking about the best interest of the child being the most important thing. Somebody in my church, because we're not evangelical Protestants, some of us are, but they could look at some of our statements of our national organization and say, oh, we can't, we can't place them with, uh, with a disciple family. Um, 
if you're going to accept federal money, certain strings come attached. All right, and thank you. Bishop Olson, your summation. The state has interests both in the practice of religious liberty and also the protection of vulnerable children and placing them in the best environment possible. Religious organizations do not lose their mission as a religious organization when the state chooses to contract with them to help meet those ends of, of the state interests in uh, the, the protection of young people. And thank you. And then Dr. Matthews. Yes, I'll, I'll close with another quote from the um, Catholic Church. It says that it has theological disagreements with um, Miracle Hill Ministries. However, we applaud their remarkable effort to um, service the, the poor. And um, I think we have to learn in America how to disagree and yet applaud th good things that people are doing. And if you don't agree with their core issues, don't marginalize them. All right, thank you. And thank you everyone for your participation today. So thank you, I've, I've been blessed by this and I hope you have too. I hope that you've, as you've turned, tuned in today, that you've appreciated what goes on here at the town hall on a regular basis. For those of you who've been here a long time with us, you know that this has been going on for decades and we hope to continue that for a long time as well. But if you're new to the program, this is the way it is. We get people from different backgrounds, different faiths, and what we do then is we help each other to understand the other's point of view. And I think that is the genius of it. We're hoping that you'll write to us and give us suggestions about topics or subjects you'd like for us to discuss here on the panel. And by the way, you can go to the website and find there some archived programs there of past discussions we've had here on the American Religious Town Hall meeting. We're actually looking forward to hearing from you with your specific suggestions or comments concerning what you hear on the program. Uh, agree or disagree, that's what this program is all about, and we appreciate your tuning in. If this is the first time you've tuned in, by the way, we're very glad you've joined us. We hope to see you again real soon. Tell your friends about it, and until next time, the charter of the American Religious Town Hall provides that Roman Catholics, Protestants, Jews, educators, and others may appear on this program and can declare their beliefs without hesitancy. And the rest of the members of the panel will uphold and guarantee that American right to all who will appear, irrespective of race or creed, so that the rest of the world can see that here in America, we believe in civil and religious freedom, not only in theory, but in reality. And so now, friends, until next time, whether you've tuned in via your television or perhaps at your computer terminal, uh, we're going to get together at the same time over this very same channel or however you tuned in. The American Religious Town Hall meeting now stands adjourned. And may the God of all of us bless all of you. <laughs>